Good morning, everyone. We will now begin the earnings call for the first quarter of 2022 and also the closing of the earnings. My name is Sergio Hibas. I'm the CEO at Irani. We also have Ojivan Kagnin. He's our finance and investor relations director. Fabian Oliveira, our personnel strategy and management uh, director. Linda Meyer, he's the director for sustainable packaging. And Enrique is our uh, paper uh, forestry and sustainable resin uh, uh, Rawson uh, director. So this is in the webinar model where um, the participants have their microphones and videos off and we'll start off with some highlights in the year and the quarter. At the end, it will be available for questions. Um, questions may be submitted through the Q&A and chat, or we can also um, open up your mics if desired. We're also providing some transition to English, so just select the option on the globe at the bottom part of your Zoom. The webinar will be recorded and provided in two languages on the Investor Relations website. So I'm going to share this presentation. Muito bem, então entrando aqui nos resultados. Now, uh, getting into the results. For 2022 and the fourth quarter, here we have the main highlights. Uh, we ended with um, a, a total of 1.686 million, 5% uh, higher than the net revenue in 2021. Our, um, Net income 378,210, 32% more in regards to 2021. The adjusted EBITDA of 537,988,000, compared to 2021. The investments in the Gaia platform uh, have already been paid uh, um, 711,443,000. We ended the year with a, a leverage of 1.38. The cost of debt in the last 12 months of 13.8% and a ROIC in the last 12 months of 23%. So getting to the numbers of the fourth quarter, we ended the quarter with a uh, operational uh, net revenue of 408,410,000, a 1.4% lower than the revenue in the fourth quarter of 2021, impacted mainly by the uh, sustainable Rawson business, and I'm going to talk about this a little more. The adjusted EBITDA of 119,236,011.1% more in regards to the fourth quarter of 2021, um, and a net income of 85,919,000, uh, 35.7% higher than the fourth quarter of 2021. And the investments that we paid uh, in the Gaia platform in the fourth quarter were 98,388,000. Now, to get into a little more details, our revenue was 7.5% lower than the third quarter and 1.4% lower than the fourth quarter of 2021 with uh, 408 million 410. The adjusted EBITDA was at 119,236,000, an EBITDA margin of 29.2%, 11.1% lower than in the fourth quarter of 2021 and 13.2% lower than the third quarter. This drop is due to the results of the Rawson business and also the seasonality in the last quarter. So the month of December is always a month that's a little weaker due to the holidays. But the biggest impact was uh, when it comes to EBITDA was really the Rawson uh, business. The net income ended with um, 85,919,000. Uh, it was lower than the third quarter due to the lower revenue, 10.1% lower, but 35.7% higher than the fourth quarter of 2021. When we look at the uh, sustainable packaging segment, the numbers from Eng Papel in the fourth quarter had a drop of 0.6% compared to the fourth quarter of 2021 and a drop of 8.7% compared to the third quarter of 22 in the overall market, ending with um, 973 million, sorry, 970,000 tons in the fourth quarter of 2022. And then in the full year, we ended 
sorry, in the fourth quarter, we ended with 1,877,000 uh, uh, meters square meters and 8.1% lower than the third quarter. In our specific case, we had um, a peak of 8.2% compared to the fourth quarter of 2021 due to the increase in our capacity for uh, in Balaj and Santa Catarina. So we had growth um, throughout the second semester of last year, but this number was 13.3% lower um, uh, in square meters, 3.9% higher. Um, and 14.4% lower than the third quarter uh, with, when it comes to pricing or prices, uh, when you look at an annual comparison, we had 7,543, a drop of 6% compared to the fourth quarter of 2021, uh, strongly influenced by the drop in the amount of the scraps, uh, which had a reduction of about 25% compared to the fourth quarter of 21 and 2.1% higher than the third quarter. So throughout the quarter, we had the semester, sorry, we had some price adjustments and this was very significant for our results uh, in the packaging business. In square meters, we had a drop that was lower of 2.1% and an increase of 3.6% from the third to the fourth quarter. When we get into the paper for sustainable packaging, which is the paper we sell directly in the market, there was a drop of six and a half percent compared to the sales in the fourth quarter of 21. So 30,216 tons. And this is mainly due to the shutdown we had to have in machine two. Machine two had to uh, be shut down in September and October. So that got a bit of the fourth quarter also. And with this, we had a small increase of 0.1% compared to the third quarter, but a drop of 6.5% uh, compared to the fourth quarter of uh, last year. And then we had sales that were practically stabilized for um, paper for um, cardboard. And these are papers for corrugated cardboard that we sell in the market. So the average prices for package uh, for flexible packaging, which is um, uh, had really good evolution last year, we were able to have a replacement of about 16.2% in the pricing and 5.3% compared to the third quarter. And so we had a uh, price adjustment from the month of October. Uh, last year and this is becoming consolidated now in the month in the first quarter of this year so this was super important for the profitability of our business and the average price of the packaging uh, which would be the paper for corrugated cardboard that we sell on the market had a drop of 6.1 percent plus an increase of 7.3 uh, compared to the third quarter and these are papers that are made with scraps and they're really uh, influenced by the drop in scraps uh, about 25 percent in a year so here you can see the scraps the evolution of the price uh, from angucci 21.9 percent this is the overall market and a drop of 1.3 percent from the third to the fourth quarter so in our specific case in the fob prices we had a drop of 24.6 percent compared to the fourth quarter and one percent compared to the third quarter ending at 782 reais per ton. The scraps continue to have a slight drop trend uh, according to the numbers disclosed by Angucci in the beginning of the, of the year, but this trend of a slight drop in the market remains due to the return um, uh, in the shipments in the second quarter and also uh, more virgin fiber paper inserted into the system, which makes the scraps market uh, be well offered. So in our case, when we look at the, S the CIF uh, prices, we had a reduction of 24%, uh, and in Santa Catarina, 20.4%, and Irene in the overall uh, number, 21.2%, and an increase in the prices of 87 from the third to the fourth quarter due to the regional mix. When we got into the sustainable Russian business, it's an exports business um, where we had mainly in the second semester last year, um, a performance that was lower 
than our forecasts, and especially due to the Chinese market, due to shutdowns and the pandemic, there was a drop in international prices and also in volumes. So with this, we had a drop of 29.9% and 24.6% compared to the third quarter, uh, ending with 2,279 uh, tons. Uh, so prices also dropped due to the uh, situation. Uh, and uh, the turpentine price is also 29.6 and 8.2. The good news, we can already notice in the first quarter of 2023, uh, uh, that there's a recovery in the volumes for sales. Prices are still suffering a bit, um, but with the returning of China, uh, we're slowly but surely noticing that the market has a little more demand in the first quarter of 2023. The Ralston market ended up being the main business with a reduction in EBITDA uh, compared to 2021. And this ended up affecting the company's EBITDA as a whole because uh, the two other businesses had performance that was a, a little better than what we had in 2022. When we got in, uh, we saw the specific results of 2022. We noticed that there was an increase, as I mentioned in the beginning, of 5% of the revenue um, and 8.9 in the EBITDA. Uh, in alcohol with 538 million margin that's higher than 2021, uh, closing up at 31.9%. The volume in sales and paper, there was a drop in the total volume of sales from one year to the other. We had an increase of one and a half percent. And our prices on average had an uh, increase of 1.8% compared to 2021, even with the drop in the scraps, as I mentioned, throughout the year of 2022. In square meters, there was a drop of 1.7%. We dropped 1.1%. And the prices in square meters, in our case, had an evolution of 4.2%. So um, when we look at the segments for paper sales, we had a, drop, a total drop of 0.9% paper for uh, markets. This drop is due to the shutdown of Machine 2. And we also sold uh, 98,000 tons for flexible uh, packaging and 26 uh, tons for rigid uh, packaging, which would be the test line um, for the market. And the average prices of the packaging for flexible packaging, uh, we had an increase of that was substantial and the average price, 16.8%. Um, and the average prices of, of, of the rigid um, packaging uh, adding up to 4,400 49, which prices 2022 due to the drop in scrap prices. Um, so we had also a drop of 11.8 percent, uh, 11,005 uh, tons of, uh, of Rawson and turpentine. The average price of the Rawson uh, was about uh, an increase of 10 percent, although in the quarterly comparison there was a drop, and the average price of turpentine compared to the average price in 2021 was a drop of 14.7 percent, uh, an average price of 1,892 in the year. As I mentioned, leverage is also really in line with our forecasts, um, even a little better. We ended the year with 1.38, with a good part of the um, Gaia uh, investments already performed. Uh, we ended with a debt position uh, of 1 billion uh, 791 um, with uh, 741 and 120 net, net debt uh, and a gross debt of 1 billion 791 with the leverage of 1.38% times. So 98% uh, is in local currency, 2% in foreign currency, 85% of the debt is long-term and 15% short-term. Most of the debt we have is uh, directly with the BNDS to perform the Gaia investments with a term of 16 years to pay. Uh, then you have a ROIC that was kept at a level that was pretty high. We had a small drop due to the increase in the cost of debt, especially due to the increase of the SELIC rate and the investments in the Gaia platforms that we already paid, but we weren't able to capture the returns for uh, the main investments. So with this, there was a slight drop, but still at a level that is really good when compared to other uh, players in the paper market around the world. 
So our uh, buyback program in 2022, we launched, uh, we closed this program that we began uh, throughout the first semester of 2021 and we launched a new one on the 18th of August. We already acquired 15.13% of the 9,833,806 um, ordinary shares that are applicable to this program for the buyback. Um, and this is gonna happen throughout this year. So in regards to the payment of dividends in the fourth quarter, we paid 0 0.096 um, and in the per share. And in the year we distributed 158,786,000 uh, in dividends, 0 0.63 per share, a dividend yield that's pretty robust of 9.27% in the year. The Gaia platform, which is the investment cycle that we're developing at the moment, is moving along very well. So, so far we have 10 projects. The Gaia objective is to address issues for competitive advantage issues of the current Irani production plants. With this, we've already defined the 10 projects. We have some others that are being studied at the moment, but these 10 projects will lead to an increase of production of a pulp of 29%. 23% uh, increase in the production of corrugated cardboard and the energy generation or power generation will have an increase of 56% with Gaia 1 and with the um, PCH is another 10% and 33% uh, becoming self-sufficient in energy generation. So here you can see the payments. As I mentioned, we already had 711 million uh, from the 1 billion 39 that we have already approved in the board 862 million uh, net and an investment that we performed in the fourth quarter of 98 million. So the main investments, which are Gaia 1, Gaia 2, and Gaia 3, have uh, the payments that are already happening at their final phase. When we take a look at uh, the schedules, we are practically up to date with all of the timelines and uh, deadlines for the main projects. For Gaia 1, we had um, the startup in the boiler in the end of the semester, and then we'll start the performance curve in the second semester. The Gaia 2 project, which is the expansion of the Santa Catarina packages, it has been completed, completed entirely. And Gaia 3, also machine 2, has been um, refurbished in the month of September and October, and it's in a performance curve. And there has been excellent performance already in the first months. Gaia three and four and five, four and five, sorry, which was the PCHs. We're still going through the license process, the environmental licensing process. This is um, extremely delicate and time consuming because it involves all of the uh, river basins, but we're moving along well and we plan to um, have at least one of the two PCHs uh, starting their projects. The other Gaia's, uh, Gaia 6, which is where you have all of the uh, 4.0 industry work um, in all of our um, factories, we should be uh, ending by the end of this year. And then we'll have the curve, the performance curve and then the expansion of the ETE, which should, should also be finished by 2023. The new uh, printer is also operational in the Indiatuba unit. The automation of the stock is also gonna be ending in the second semester of this year. And we have a performance curve in the beginning of next year and the acquisition of a new printer, which is a new project um, uh, for it's a, a cutting edge technology uh, printer. And we're gonna be able to optimize the production of these boxes in the unit in Santa Catarina. It's a new project with pretty good results and um, it's gonna be deployed in the first semester of 2024. So as we saw the percentage uh, for the projects, we see 83% of the physical ex execution in uh, Gaia 1, 95% in Gaia 2. Uh, and um, this is still in the process for licensing the system for management um, and the new uh, printers 90% and automation of the intermediate intermediate stock, 26.9%. The new printer, we have uh, this negotiation phase going through. Um, so another important point is that we're a strong recycler uh, representing this business model and the circular economy. We're one of the biggest recyclers in, for paper in Brazil. In the last 12 months, we recycled uh, 
160,000 tons, 170,000 tons, sorry. And in the fourth quarter, 61,000. 386 and um, the plastic we recycle that comes together with the scraps, we recycle 1,307 tons of plastic in the last 12 months and 379 uh, tons in the fourth quarter of 2022. We renewed our credit period for another seven years for the um, MVL project where we have some credits that have been approved by the UN. So these the uh, 42,000 CERs are once again, we're receiving uh, values regarding these credits, the carbon credits. We also invested 910,000 um, in different projects for um, uh, culture, sports, inclusion, education in the surrounding communities. And we also redirected 3.2 mi million for um, cultural and incentive projects in the surrounding communities. In the fourth quarter, we also had the inclusion of Irani in the dividends index for the stock exchange, where you have an important highlight due to the payment of dividends we had, which was very robust with our payment policy of 25% throughout the quarters plus 25% um, additionally, in the closing of the year, ever since the lever, as long as the leverage is uh, lower than two and a half times, and we also included in the sustainability index for B3, which gathers the companies that are most well uh, assessed when we look at practices for governance. And we also had um, an amount invested in affirmative and governance uh, ESG topics. Um, we were a company that was recognized as one of the best in the sector. And we were also considered a GPTW company in all of our units. They're the eighth best uh, company to work in uh, Houston, just one the fifth best in Santa Catarina. And we're among the 20 best industries to work at in Brazil. And we also received the prize for diversity and as the companies that most have people uh, working uh, with over 50 years and are involved in our activities. For the second consecutive year, we also received the Transparency Trophy uh, among the 10 companies with the most transparent uh, balance sheet uh, with the category of up to 5 billion. We received the third uh, place in the Innovation Award in Sustainability. We were among the best in Brazil uh, in the humanized uh, research among the 11 organizations, which is a survey that was launched um, in 2020, 2021 that we participated in for the first time. We were among the best um, for management. We were the second company in the state of uh, Santa Catarina to receive this award. And once again, we received the award uh, for the best uh, in management in the cycle for 2022. We received the award uh, from Izami for the best in ESG in 2022. And in third place in the uh, forestry category of the top open corps, which was the connection of the companies with um, startups, such as Irani Labs, which is how we uh, connect with this environment for startups. And um, our team for investor relations, Ajiva is leading this as the finances and investor relations director, and Andrea is our manager. Uh, Maya Vicenzo and Daniela uh, are analysts uh, and available um, to clarify any data about the company. And in the financial area, we have Marco supporting us with the finance aspects and accounting of and Alex, besides um, Giovanna Nabucco in a new business. So this is the team available for our investors. And now I would like to um, mention that our team is available to clarify any questions that um, those uh, participating may have about the presentation. Ojivam, please. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, prior to anything else, just wanna say good morning and thank you for participating in this webinar and the possibility to interact. Please feel free to submit your questions on Q&A or chat or just raising your hand. We'll open up your mic so you can speak. We have some questions already. We have Guilherme uh, from XP. He has four questions actually. I will read one by one, Sergio, to make it easier to answer. 
His first question is, well, uh, I would like to hear from you guys about the perspectives for volumes of cor corrugated cardboard and paper for packaging for 23. If you could also talk about uh, corrugated cardboard, about which are the main segments that have added most uh, demand. Then he has three other questions. I'll read all three. Let me answer one by one. If not, I'll forget. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay, let's go one by one. So um, we work with the forecast that BPO discloses and they work with the uh, FGV Foundation. They have three scenarios, right? They look at the most optimistic scenario, a moderate scenario, and a more pessimist scenario. For the moderate scenario, the estimate for growth is 2.6% for 2023. So the market uh, in this first quarter has been a little weaker. Um, in the month of December, we felt this. The month of November was a little better, but in February, we see that the market's a little weaker, but we expect that there'll be some recovery from March onwards. And the forecasts for the second semester um, are way above what we saw last year in the first months. Uh, we're not that good. Um, so with that, we should have an evolution of 2.6% according to FGV in this corrugated cardboard scenario for this year. So the main segments that have gained a share are the um, animal protein segments with important expansion. I don't know if Lindomar has any other points to add on to that. So yeah, Sergio, that's perfect. Um, animal protein, especially poultry and uh, swine, pork, we've had significant growth. January is 20% higher than January last year. So although it's a scenario that's a little more complicated for, um, for meat and beef, it's a little more complicated, but uh, we have had bigger volumes with uh, swine and poultry. Yeah, so that's the unit we had. Um, to be able to consider this advance with significant um, volumes. The second question from Guilherme is that we also saw a small drop in the margins in the fourth quarter. And we'd like to understand what are the perspectives for the first quarter of 23 and 2023 as a whole. I think margins above 25% would be the next level for Irene. Well, um, actually in the fourth quarter the margins dropping is really related to the volumes that are a little lower than the third quarter and also some seasonality uh, with expenses in the end of the year uh, salary adjustments which influences things with the increases in prices we had in the quarter plus the increases in price in paper we've had um that are um, being that are taking place till the month of May of March. Sorry, you can discuss this a bit with the cycles of price increases. We should keep the margins at the same levels um, that we've been disclosing in the last quarters. Um, Enhiki, do you want to contribute to this? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so we in the segment for flexible uh, cardboard. And we've been readjusting our prices um, ever since November last year. And we basically have the full uh, portfolio already. And um, there's some things that we still need to uh, pass on that go from like May or June this year, but an increase in prices that really reflects what, what happened in the end of last uh, year with the fi uh, virgin fiber paper, there was um, salary readjustment. So there was an increase in prices um that with the entire market and that will help during the margins in the year of 2023 so the next question uh, from guilherme is also about the uh, resins uh we saw that the volumes are pushing the results downwards and what happened here so what are the perspectives for the quarter and for 2023 as well so can i talk about that Sergio? yeah so here actually in the fourth quarter for residents, we had um, a perfect storm, right? So this market, we export more to Europe and Asia. And the fourth quarter in Europe was super bad due to the war in Ukraine and Russia. So a lot of industries have already stopped preventively. And uh, because of that, the demands dropped a lot. Um, and adding on, as you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, when you talked about the zero COVID policy in China, that's another very important market for us. So the two main markets, which are uh, the drivers that make this um, demand higher drop at the same time, 
And that's why we had um, this drop. Uh, but the perspectives for the first quarter is that we already noticed a slight improvement. And this was also because the winter in Europe was not as bad. So the industry in Europe seemed to be a catastrophe in the first quarter, hasn't really believed, uh, behaved in this way. And China is coming back to the market. The market opened the economy once again. So the perspective is that we'll have a slight improvement in this market for uh, resins in the first quarter throughout the year. And I think the perspective is that we'll have uh, an improvement from the second or third quarters onwards. Exactly. Great. So now the fourth quarter from Guilherme is he wants to understand um, what would be the new investment cycle for Irani. Uh, we remember that at Irani Day, you talked about this new cycle. We want to understand, considering the current market scenario, if this is really being discussed and if the focus is 100% in the Gaia platform now. Well, the focus now is 100% of the Gaia platform because we're at the final phase of the main investments. Gaia 1 is... Uh, really, really demanding a lot from the company um, to kind of stick through with the same uh, deadlines and trying to do the best we could when it comes to investments. Um, and our energy was really focused on this uh, with the completion of the projects in uh, the Gaia platform and also possible um, projects we're looking into that will complete the Gaia platform. I want to remind you that the concept is that we want to address all of the competitive issues uh, for the uh, Gaia platform uh, that the company has and its production plans. So with the Santa Catarina packaging project and the Tuba packaging project and also the paper uh, production plan, uh, we address some of the biggest investments, um, but we still have um, some projects that we should be complementing this uh, process. And we have a new cycle also. Uh, we're completing the cycle, already thinking about the next cycle. And so we're at this uh, steady phase to really understand which path we should be following. But the idea is that we'll complete the Gaia platform till 2024 and launch a new investment cycle in 2025 when the leverage position will already start dropping uh, in regards to the investments for this current cycle. Okay, perfect. Uh, then we have Amaudi Puker. Uh, he has his hands raised. Um, Mari. Amaudi, can you hear us? Can you speak? Yeah. Well, if you'd like to speak, just raise your hand once again, okay? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, perfect. First of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to um, hear from you guys at this moment. I was uh, making lunch and uh, also hearing you guys speak. I'm an investor, an individual CP, uh, investor. I'm a mediocre investor. And um, for the past two years, I started to understand it any better and get to know it any um, through these presentations. And, and I was really happy, right? To get to know the company and it any that I was not aware of up until then. So I have um, two main problems. The first is that I'm going bankrupt and I'd like to invest more because um, I believe that it any um, will um, have a, a big potential still. And that's my main um, concern. So uh, the second concern is I would like to know um, about from you guys, when you look at the turbulence in the market, uh, in the retail market, up until when will this turbulence that's going on in our country with companies that uh, no one would ever imagine getting into um, uh, chapter 11 is something going on. And it seems it's just the point of the iceberg. So up until where could this um, interfere in the growth in the, uh, or investments of Eden E? Well, Mori, thank you for your comments. Every investor is extremely important. So. We really value our investors and individual investors. We have almost 60,000 individuals that are uh, investing in. Uh, 
in our company. So it's a very important group for us when we look our, at our shareholder base. So Irene has projects. We're like a real life uh, company. And of course, the macroeconomic turbulences do affect us um, as they affect um, all of the companies. But we're always monitoring this and working with this um, in the best way possible um, to keep profitability high with a little more or less exports, managing uh, margins, customer by customer and product by product. But of course, no one is left out uh, from the macroeconomic um, setbacks, but from a mid to long term perspective, it's a very uh, solid company with fundamentals that are also solid, that are completely integrated, our own force base projects and investments that are expected with good returns on investments. And of course, it's an investment that is really interesting for whoever has a mid to long term vision. It's difficult for us to talk about the short term because this is, of course, subject to other variations from a macroeconomic perspective. Great. Thank you, Amari, for the question. So uh, the next question um, that hasn't been identified here in the chat, but it is uh, kind of in the same line. So with a possible uh, global recession and increase in the global inflation, how is it any looking at the year of 2023 and how does this impact the company as a whole? Well, pretty much in line with the same point, right? So we can't um, foresee all of the variables that we'll have to face throughout the year. Of course, the macroeconomic scenario is more challenging, but we do have signs that with the recovery in China that he referred to uh, kind of warming up the international market a little more, but of course, the macroeconomics worldwide and the channels uh, for exports and imports and the macroeconomic scenario uh, in the country affect our business uh, as they affect the businesses of all of the companies that are in this context. So we're keeping our eyes open. Our position is pretty good um, considering the margins we have and the investments we're working on. And with this, uh, we also have the beginning of economic activities that are a little weaker this year. Uh, with our investment uh, projects in line and capturing these returns. So our expectations are that we'll have a pretty good year with results, but a bit more challenging than 2021 and 22. Um, perfect. So Marina, uh, good afternoon. Uh, hi, Marina, how's it going? So what's your guys' vision on the demand at this moment for the market, uh, considering that we'll have part of the experts from uh, Brazil blocked. We have a lot of factories that are shutting down. How is um, Irene working on this with the balanced stocks? Is this being enough to keep these prices stable for recycled packaging? Actually, uh, hey, how's it going? So the main issue here from a macroeconomic perspective uh, affects us, of course. But the beginning of the year, uh, the stocks of paper really increased. We've been administrating this so far. Um, we haven't had any shutdowns expected, but we're managing this. If we have to shut down some machine, we'll do this um, so that we can control stocks uh, due to lower demand. But up until now, that's not the case. And when it looks, when we look at the players with um, animal protein and the batteries, uh, we're in the Midwest region of Santa Catarina. Most of our sales are to animal protein with swine and poultry. We have very small sales in um, uh, be beef and um, that's why we normally are not affected by any kind of embargoes or limitations towards um, imports from Brazil. Uh, exports, sorry, from Brazil. So then we have uh, Jacqueline also. She raised her hand. Please, Jacqueline, open up your mic. Could you open up your mic, please? We're asking um, her to just open up her mic. Okay, Jacqueline. Great. Hi, Jacqueline. How's it going? You may speak. Your mic is open. Uh, maybe we can move on to another. Yeah. All right. That's fine. So here we have another question from Gustavo. 
Francisco Pato. Hey, good morning. Could you talk about the market share that Irani has in its segments? Our market share in paper is about 5%. Um, we have the paper we transfer to our factories for corrugated cardboard. And in the segment for packaging with corrugated cardboard, we have a market share of 4%. Perfect. So, Santiago Santos, he says that with the increase um, in debt was already expected and the leverage indexes are pretty controlled. Uh, although the indexes are pretty comfortable. And so the financial expenses, um, but it's a secondary effect, right? Because the uh, calculation is you have the operational results plus the employed capital. So uh, initially that doesn't affect that so much. Um, but due to the uncertain scenario, it would be interesting to have additional comments on protections for debt uh, and uh, action plans where if you have an increase in the interest uh, rate internationally and nationally. We manage this, we have some forecasts and our leverage indexes should remain uh, very well, con well controlled till the end of the Gaia platform. And we should uh, assess new investments, always considering the levels of leverage trying to be below two and a half times in a conservative perspective. But of course, in uh, investment periods, we could be a little bit higher than this. Um, but then when we still don't capture the investments of the uh, that are in curse, but our uh, policy is to be very careful and keep leverage always below two and a half times. So we've been always looking at uh, a, big, a big concern with liquidity which made us uh, consider the debentures uh, in October now, uh, last year. So we issued 720 million reais and we were preparing um, for this um, more challenging snare in 2023. So we have um, very well controlled leverage and it's gonna go up a little bit more as you have the uh, conclusion of the plat Gaia platform but the liquidity is really high uh, without talking about the average debt term, which is pretty long. So in our forecast, we don't have to go to the market in the next years to refinance uh, some kind of debt. So the capital structure is very uh, comfortable because we've already uh, gone through some recessions as the ones we're looking at. We know how difficult it is to have to go to the market and roll out the debts when the uh, debt, when the interests are so high as they're at the moment. So the next one from Santiago is if you could talk about the sale of the honey um, shares on behalf of the controller. Well, I could talk about that. The controller actually uh, is selling part of the shares due to some financial commitments that they need to handle uh, at the holding level. And so there are many assets and one of them is Irani's share. So they're selling a share that's not that relevant. It's pretty small to be able to handle liquidity and these uh, commitments. Um, and, but this is a decision from the controller. Um, so it's really a cash flow vision uh, from a holding perspective. Now, from the company perspective, the company is buying back. So we have this buyback program that's underway and we can uh, have this uh, program and we continue to buy back some different shares from the company because the value in the stock uh, doesn't represent the intrinsic value of the company. Well, um, Matias is asking about what we can expect with the increase in the revenue and reduction of costs in 2023 with the Gaia platform, especially phase two and eight after the biggest payments with the Gaia platform occurring in the last two years. I do believe the investment levels are gonna start declining in the beginning of this year, right? Well, actually we still have the completion of some of these payments, as we mentioned. Uh, above 1 billion that we've already approved and we already paid 711. So we have at least 300 million still that are going to be paid throughout this year and completing uh, Gaia platform. Some of the new investments that we have uh, been approving by the board 
will occur due to the level of leverage that we have at that moment. And as long as we have um, returns that are in line with what we consider to be reasonable in this higher interest scenario. Great, I'll open up Evandro's mic so he can speak as well, Evandro. Can you speak? Good morning. Uh, first of all, good uh, congratulations to Irani for the excellent work they've been doing with the company and really making investors like me um, happy with the results and with the earnings that the company has been achieving. My question is that I would like to know about when we'll be completing all of the uh, platform, the Gaia platform work. Um, and it will be now in 2023 that we'll be finishing all of the investments uh, in this Gaia platform investments. I'm from Ereshin here in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, close to Irani. And I would like to know if there's any possibility for eventually visiting the company in Santa Catarina to get to know. Thank you. Uh, of course, Evandro. Our factories are always open to our uh, shareholders. We just need to organize this with André, uh, our manager for investor relations. And it's going to be a pleasure to welcome our investors uh, at the production plant. Right, Enrique? Yes. Um, so the Gaia platform, uh, as I mentioned, most of the investments are going to be completed this year. Uh, so uh, there may be some others that would extend a bit more, but the investments that are approved should be completed. Uh, basically, all of them should be concluded by 2023. Maybe just the last one, Gaia 10, which will probably come in at the end of 2024. All of the rest will be ending this year. Evandri, you can send an email to ir.edeni.com.br and me and Andrea and the IR team will organize this visit, okay? Great. So this is uh, Xing. Uh, so we noticed that Eden is getting market share while the market is setting down. Uh, could you explain a bit of the competitive dynamic and if this is sustainable? Thank you. How's it going, Shin? Um, actually, we gain market share due to the expansion we're working on in Santa Catarina. This uh, growth was in the second semester of last year. When you look at the comparison, there's relevant gains in volumes and we continue throughout this year increasing the volume of Santa Catarina. That factory had an increase of almost 60% in its capacity. And so we continue to have volumes to fill out the capacity of the of Santa Catarina factory, especially uh, looking at the uh, animal protein segments, um, swine and poultry. So what's going to be the percentage of this new issuance that's going to be directed to CapEx and liability management? Um, yes, I could talk about that. Actually, the issuance was done with the main objective of funding activities um, in agribusiness, uh, maintenance of forests throughout the uh, operation, which would be seven years. But of course, we have to control the application of these resources but the resources and cash um, will be able to manage as we uh, have the best interests in the company. So the idea is that um, we can really um, reinforce our cash position to be able to face a possible uh, period with greater challenges or difficulties or even perform liability management. We still haven't decided this. We have a debenture from 2019 that has a possibility to be paid uh, fully by July this year. Um, so it is a possibility to use the cash for the payment of this debenture because there's higher costs um, than the resources we captured now. But since we have this option and it's not something that needs to be defined now, we'll be taking advantage of the benefit to be able to understand how the scenario will be and then decide this uh, throughout 2023. 
So this uh, can be from July 2023 onwards, right? So it's September, October, any moment of the second semester. And so uh, we also have uh, this opportunity um, to maybe um, pay this debenture um, in this macroeconomic scenario that we're looking at in 2023. So we understand that liquidity is fundamental. Uh, and so it's uh, applicable to have a, like a buffer for liquidity if we have a challenging scenario this year, but also for liability management that Jovan has mentioned. So Vitor, um, he's also asking about, um, he wants to congratulate us and um, the main questions were already answered, but if we look at a scenario that's more extreme, uh, with um, some kind of a flu uh, or bird flu, how would you be able to redistribute this into other segments? Of course, if this segment um, has a crisis as this one, like a sanitary crisis, this will affect us, but we do have a possibility to participate in the food sector that's really robust. And so um, big accounts, big customers, and eventually they could substitute some loss in volumes that we could have an, a customer. So this is part of our dynamic. We've already gone through these kinds of bird flu situations in prior moments, and um, we had to search for volumes in other segments. Uh, we had a high level of uh, competitive advantage, um, and this helps us provide more uh, volumes if we have any specific crisis in this uh, sector. Is that it, Linda Meyer? Yes, exactly. We have some final questions here. Um, in our, we have Leonardo, um, and he wants to know about how we're looking at the price for the scraps in 2023 and how this dynamic uh, could impact the final prices for packaging. Uh, so this uh, has been on a drop ever since that peak in the beginning of the semester of 2021. Um, and they've been facing a possible tra uh, downward trend uh, with the recomposition of the entire um, supply chain. Um, so with the recomposition of this, uh, prices have already started to drop. And with the shipments getting back to good levels throughout the year, we have a drop in scraps. So the forecast, um, is really for a slight trend uh, downwards. Um, and uh, so the main producers announced um, this um, makes more uh, virgin fiber paper to be placed in the internal market. And with this, we have um, a better offering for scraps and the craft liner mar international market is quite turbulent in the beginning of this year. So this makes uh, more fiber paper in Brazil be present to substitute recycled paper. Um, so we have a few more questions here. But we have another question also uh, of requesting an update uh, with for guys in line with the schedule. If we had in, uh, increases due to the inflation in certain components, we still haven't ended the investments for all of the projects. For Gaia 2, which is practically complete, um, we were pretty much in line with the budget. Um, and so we're going to disclose these numbers. And so Gaia 1 is a bigger project that involves materials, civil construction, and there was an increase in the budget, uh, but nothing very significant to the scenario with inflation. Uh, we will also be disclosing these numbers. Um, and Gaia 3, is also a little higher, uh, but of course, in a, a scenario with a bigger inflation, uh, as uh, the ones we experienced in 2022, we had to have some renegotiation work, especially for some items that have um, inputs uh, that had some impacts, um, and also the cost of labor that increased a lot as well uh, last year due to the inflation. So this, of course, in fact, affected this. Um, 
but the overall returns uh, were a little better due to the increases in prices that were above the inflation when it comes to paper and packaging. Okay, perfect. Well, Jacqueline, uh, um, we have another question here from, uh, this was already answered about uh, the sale. Uh, and Gustavo asks, about what's the main reason why the company doesn't uh, apply interest on uh, private capital, uh, capitalized interest. And actually, Gustav, we don't use this because due to the shareholding structure in the company, we have different companies that uh, have stakes in Irani and they tax uh, their own capital uh, at the holding level. So this doesn't bring that many benefits when you look at the savings the company would have. Considering this is a financial expense, uh, looking at the sum of the taxes at the holding level. So this not, this calculation or the math doesn't really make sense uh, to use this methodology. Um, so that's why it's actually not favorable for the company. It could, because you have to pay for the Pisco Fings taxes. Whoever has stake in Irene as an illegal entity has to pay for the Pisco Fings tax. So it's considered like, a revenue, a financial revenue. So that's actually not favorable to, to consider this um, process. Uh, Flavio is also asking about the follow-up on investments of 300 million mentioned for CapEx of 2023. Uh, for guide, doesn't really match with the numbers on the chart that was applied previously with less than 200 million CapEx. Could you confirm this? Um, I think this difference uh, well, I was kind of summarizing this, but let me just confirm the numbers so I don't uh, give you any wrong information. Just one second. Um, so the approved investments would be 1 billion and 39, and we paid uh, about 711 million so far. So this provides uh, 328 million as payments for this year. And then we have the maintenance capex, exactly. So maybe part will be for 2024 still. Yeah. Great. So Alexandri, uh, I will, was welcomed by Andrea's team at the in the Atuba factory, and it was spectacular. I can notice people's uh, motivation and focus. So congratulations. Um, thanks for your recognition there. Here we also have uh, another question here. Congratulations on the results. Is there a possibility for you to need to expand to other states in Brazil? Well, in our expansion plan for 2025, eventually we could be advancing uh, in different geographies. But actually our production plans cover the South and Southeast markets that represent 80% of the consumer market for corrugated cardboard packaging. So when you gather the Midwest regions that we also service with freights and uh, returning freights and Goyaz, it's also close to our the Tuba factory, we end up um, covering about 90% or 86% of the uh, market as a whole. Um, so the North region is another 2% and that's basically the entire market being covered by the production plants we have currently. So Bruno Oliveira, how do you consider the expansion of paper and packaging uh, for Latin America? Or is this focus in the internal market even with uh, clubbing, focusing different efforts? Uh, our focus is integrated, right? So we could even um, sell a bit of the paper in the market, but this is not our main strategy. Our main strategy is to produce um, recycled paper, or virgin fiber paper, to be able to transfer them to our conversion units. So any kind of investments we have in this direction uh, would necessarily be expanding our capacity for production. And if there's any leftovers, eventually we could be exporting as we've already done today uh, in the internal market for exports. But that's not our strategy uh, initially. Our strategy would be the conversion of the corrugated cardboard uh, paper in our production plants. But then for fiber, for virgin fiber, uh, with the expansion of Gaia One, we'll have another 30% pulp and paper. And then it's gonna to be totally focused on the market for exports and the internal market. 
which would be paper that uh, most of the returns from Gaia 1 come from an improvement in the mix. We'll be producing more paper for virgin fibers and less recycled paper. Great, so we've already reached um, our schedule. Well, we'll be answering the three last questions. And then if anyone has any other questions, please send emails to our investor relations point. Um, So we also have uh, another question, if there's a mapping out uh, risks or possible change from the changes in the laws from the federal government about um, forests and developing forests. In Hiki. We look at the short term, there's nothing mapped out that will worsen the forestry expansion area. We closely monitor this and we have no major changes that will affect our um, forestry production development. But anyways, we are members of IPA and all of the laws and modifications that exist in this area are monitored closely and we um, act whenever we need to. Great, we have another point here from Shin. Um, sh uh, the pandemic displaced the prices for commodities and papers upwards. Are these levels of pairs uh, sustainable in the long term? Thank you once again. Of course, um, prices um, are about supply and demand. So if there's a big recession, of course, prices are gonna give in. But we have uh, noticed that prices have remained slightly below uh, what they reached in 2022. And we've been able to keep this because uh, although there's been a slight um, drop, um, these prices to kept, were kept at a stable average. Well, then we have another question here from Fernando Castro who said, um, I've been investing in the company. I want to thank you for the shirts I received. Me and my wife always uh, go around doing marketing and I would like to get to know the company as well whenever I can. I'm from San Jose de los Campos in Sao Paulo and I always travel to Puerto Alegre. Well, send us an email, please, Fernando, and we'll um, try to organize it. Yes, yeah, so you can always use that shirt. It's wonderful. Use that shirt and uh, mark us on social media. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, two last questions here that I think we should answer. The first one is uh, if you're assessing some kind of a distribution for, um, actually that's in the, uh, we distribute 25% um, to our shareholders. And since we were below 2.5 times the net debit, then we already have a forecast to distribute another 25% of the profit in the whole year, establishing 50% payout, which is what we are considering in our dividend distribution uh, policy. So this is actually already uh, mentioned in our disclosures and those 25 additional percent will be uh, discussed and decided upon at the general shareholders meeting in April. And the last point, which I think is very important is if there's any big player interested in it and if there's a chance that there could be a change in the control. Uh, well, uh, if any players are interested, they haven't let us know yet. But um, at the moment, this is not on our radar. We have no players that are approaching us and our project is really to uh, have investments from Irani with our expansion projects that are done organically, which is always our preference, and assessing, of course, uh, any possible inorganic projects that could come around. Perfect. So uh, I think since we just have one last question here, it's from Alexandri. Uh, Asali about how he, Irani could provide visibility to the market to recognize the actual value of the land accounted by the acquisition value and the valuation. Well, um, uh, when you look at this uh, calculation, we already mentioned this updated value of the sh of the land. There's value of over 500 million reais in land that's not recognized in our asset because of the accounting standards that don't allow you to reassess land. But we have to follow the standards, the accounting standards. So what we did was that we considered this with our explanation. So whoever is reading our um, financial statements can see that there will be additional value uh, for the land uh, mentioned, but actually reassessing and acknowledging we can't do that because we can't um, disclose this also um, extensively. 
that uh, the values of land are worth more than they actually are registered as in the accounting. So we understand that that's already enough. Uh, all of the companies that have forest bases, right? So we provide disclosure on the financial statements. And that's where you can see the actual value of the uh, current value of the land. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time and attention. And let's hope that 2023, we're still excited. As I mentioned, we are at a phase where we're really capturing the returns on investments, although the economic activity is a little weaker this year. We are optimistic about uh, Irene's results. So warm regards and see you next quarter. Bye. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.